Welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast. Now, some of you may be going, you know, a couple times you just called it the I Hate Matt Wall Podcast. I know. I keep fucking up. I don't even know what the name of this fucking show is. But I do want to welcome you to episode whatever number this is, but part 17 of my ongoing discussion with the Bucks man himself, Matthew Buckley Smith. You know, from the horse's mouth, part 17 here of this fine interview. So, today, that's gonna happen. (laughs) Jesus fucking Christ. I actually bent this whole fucking episode over and stuck it where the sun don't shine. Jesus. I have so much to talk to you guys about. I just have to find the information. Here's the deal, guys. If you have not bequeathed, yes, bequeathed the gift of five stars for this podcast, you have no heart. It is fucking Christmas season, folks. It is the holidays No matter what your religious background is, it is the time for giving. And I am giving you this show. So in return, thou shall give us the five stars on iTunes. And a nice review. That would be that would be cool. I I would dig that. That would be lovely. Yes. So I'm sitting here having a chalada. It is Friday morning. No. It is the, no, it is Friday morning, motherfucker. Look what's happening. No, it's Friday morning, and I cannot wait for this episode to go up because it is very good. But I have a backlog of things I want to do episodes about. I did not think that this conversation was going to be a three, nay, 17 part fucking series. But, you know, come see, come saw, carpe diem, Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. Everything's falling apart. But I do want to ask you something. Like, yes, you are going to give me five stars for Christmas. I completely understand this. But you have friends that you should be doing something nice for this fucking holiday season. And what better way to show your friends how much you fucking love them than to fucking tell them to fucking jump in and do this fucking show. Subscribe, listen, dig, feel, become a part of. Yes, it is the holidays. So, do that. But guess what, folks? I need to even look because there's even more shout-outs that I have to get to. Because, like covid Like the flu, like all of these things, the big swinging dick-itis that comes hitherto from me to all of you is spreading and spreading and spreading. And motherfuckers are going to have to start getting inoculated against big swinging dick-itis. But since 30% of the population doesn't believe in vaccines... This should be great. Like 30%. I could live with 30%. But, um, you know, like we we go in hard. We go in raw. Okay. Because we are spreading big swinging dick-itis all over the globe. All over the globe. So let's see what's going on here. Because we got some new motherfucking dick swinging over here okay so let's try to get through this list first off i want to give a big thank you to you beautiful folks over on patreon michael cedar deborah harry you guys are the shit and you guys have been with me probably longer than anybody and i'm asking you now you'll get more out of all of this if you come over to youtube just saying okay but thank you for your ongoing support you guys are fucking awesome now i want to give a big thank you 
to the thank you fucking crew. The people who aren't in it to get stuff from me. They're in it because they fucking appreciate me and fucking love me, which makes me love you right back. So I want to give a big fucking thank you to Patrick, to JH, to Britt, to Alan, I know you're out there, to AM, I know you're out there. Thank you guys too. You guys are fucking awesome. Kisses, mwah. Hugs, the whole fucking shaboozle. Okay? You guys are great. And now, I need to give the big fucking shout outs to who? The big swinging dicks of the Anarchy Crew. Who or what? Swinging for the fences and knocking the balls over the balls. You know who you are, but I'm going to fucking tell you anyway. Because I'm that kind of guy. Thank you to Nate. Thank you to Mindy. Thank you, Bunny. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Shaylin. Thank you, Caitlin. And a new member of the Anarchy Crew. Someone who has been lurking for a long time. And going back and forth with me on emails and comments. I want to give a massive shout out. And a wonderful thank you to my fucking homie motherfucking bro, Andrew Paul. You're the shit, motherfucker. Thank you. And we can't fucking go too much farther without talking about our number one chappy. SDG, thank you. You're amazing. I love you. You're great. All right. So, you guys, seriously... You fucking blow my mind with how much you fucking love and how much you give and how much you grow. And when I see your fucking writing, it's fucking amazing. So you guys are fucking awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, moving on to the main motherfucking content. We are going to do the end of the What Is Your Poetry tag with Bucksman Jack. Okay, I'm just making up names for him now. By the, by the time we're done here, he's going to be like Sammy Two Socks or something like that. So here we go. Let's just leave you with that. And here is the motherfucking shoe. Okay, so we hit that one already. Oh, um, geography. Does that play a part in the poetry you like? Remind me how you answered that question. I answered it in, um, like, I love reading poetry from LA poets because like especially like if like there's anyone talking about like Bunker Hill which doesn't really exist anymore so to hear people talk about a place where I know the streets but the actual place they're talking about is not there that like blows my mind and then just reading stuff from people who I don't know used to who talk like my grandpa talked you know, sure. like, and I could like hear like my grandpa saying these words, you know, like that, it moves me in a way that yeah. poetry from like England would not be able to move me. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. That, that, yeah, no, that, that, to that totally makes sense. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, I, cause my first thought was like, I usually read poems by people who speak English, uh, but yeah, I, I like, so I just today read, in addition to your book, I read this selected um, by A. Stallings, who's one of my, one of my very, very favorite uh, living poets. And she is also from Atlanta and she also went to school at the University of Georgia. Um, and so she has a, you know, she then moved to Athens, Greece from, from she, so she, the University of Georgia is in Athens, Georgia. She moved from one Athens to another. Uh, and so most of her poems are set in Greece or in, you know, some Greek myth or something, but, mm -hmm. but she has some that are recognizably Athens and that, yeah, like that tweaks my heart a little bit. And I think there are certainly, if you, if you're writing poems about places that feel like that I've lived, so I guess, you know, Baltimore, especially Athens, yeah. Atlanta. Yeah, like that's going to get to me a little bit, but that's so rare. Like it's so rare for me to read something and think, well, oh, this is about a specific 
place I know that I don't even really think about it as a factor in my enjoyment of poetry. Well, you know, like when you were just on that last episode you did where um, everyone was talking shit on how Southern the <laughs> dialect and everything yeah. was and you're like, no, that's charming. That's just how it is. You know, like, what are you talking yeah, about? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you have anything it is, like yeah, it's that? It's a caricature, but it's also accurate. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I... I do think that there's a, like, you, you can't grow, like, you, you can't be literate in this country and not, like, have some tolerance for, like, New York fiction. Like, there's, mm -hmm. just, there's just so much New York fiction. D ditto LA. Yeah. LA is noir and, and is in movies more than books, but there's plenty, I mean, there's tons of LA fiction uh, and nonfiction. The, the Brad Lighthouser book I read was, you know, obviously set in LA. Um, so I think like it, no matter where you're from, you sort of have to be used to LA fiction, New York fiction. Mm -hmm. If you're not from the South, I think people just have a different tolerance for it. From the South, I've read a ton of Southern fiction. I enjoy Southern fiction. I don't feel like I have a special attachment to it. Yeah. I didn't even feel necessarily very Southern until I left the South. And then I mm -hmm. met a bunch of people who were not from there and I heard them talk about it. And that's when I started feeling like, oh, they're actually, I do actually have some connection to this place. But yeah, I feel like, like there's a certain kind of like country rock or Southern food or Southern fiction that if you're not from there and you haven't acquired a taste for it, it can put you off. And, and rock also, you know, I mean, that's the thing. It's like Southern culture and black culture also are like deeply, deeply braided together. And, yeah. and, the, and the South has influenced, you know, popular music in a way that it is not influenced popular fiction. But uh, yeah, I, I think like if I have a geographical bias, it's just that like I'm not put off by Southern stuff in a way that other yeah. people are just like, just they just sort of turn up, uh, turn up their noses at it. Yeah. Like I was um, actually sent an email to Alice about this, but one of my favorite authors of fiction is this guy named Carter Brown. Are you familiar? No. Okay. Carter Brown wrote about four novels a month for about 20 years okay <laughs> and the reason why i bring this up he um he allegedly at his heyday like so like mid 60s probably um was the biggest selling author worldwide there was like six million of his books in print or sold or something like that he was john f kennedy's favorite fucking author allegedly yeah. and his books are like hard-boiled detective shit um like yeah. depending on what character it is they either take place in la or they take place in new york or they take place in miami okay right. carter brown his real name's alan yates he's from australia and never had been to america <laughs> and oh. um oh yeah i heard something about this yeah 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 and he uh, like um yeah, sure. his shit's been translated in like every country there's been like tv shows about his characters in japan like he was just like this like worldwide cultural phenomenon that just like fucking vanished like when he when he died that was it like okay i'm dead i'm not writing any more books like i'm out and um, so Alice was, ta I was talking to Alice. I'm like, yeah, dude, my favorite um, Australian writer is the only one I know besides Neville Shute. And I don't even think Neville Shute was 100% Australian, but we'll go with this. And she's like, I have no idea who you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. You, you're talking about like the, the myth of authenticity, which I mean, for what, like, it is definitely easier to impersonate a New York writer or an LA writer than than probably anybody else just because real. there's so much stuff to copy. British people and Australian people, all actors, are usually pretty good at picking up a generic newscaster American accent. Um, we're much worse, at, American actors are much worse at doing them. And it's not because we're worse actors, it's just because like they're washed over in our culture. For real. And it's the same reason like people are not very good at doing Southern accents. like you know even even hearing like that's the thing is like you, you hear like a hollywood movie about the south you'll hear like 15 different accents all yeah. supposedly from the same small town but like 
none of them is from a real place. Like, like, like it's and see, the thing like, is, like, I, like, that's even just plausibly from somewhere. I wouldn't know that watching sure, that, yeah, but yeah, yeah. you, you watching yeah. that would go fake, 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 maybe no yeah. fake, you know? So it's just, it's weird how that works. But like yeah, going but back to because it's it's a it's a yeah it's more of a niche of people it doesn't yeah it hasn't it hasn't suffused the culture in the same way yeah well like uh, some of the the whole reason why I wanted you to go over this thing is because I did this on a whim on YouTube or whatever and then got tagged by Eleanor because Eleanor did mm. it and I had never met Eleanor yeah. or heard of Eleanor before so Eleanor did the thing. And then on that thing, she mentioned Slee Ricketts, like in her answers to shit. And then that's how I ended up on your doorstep. So this it's all it's all because of this yeah. bullshit. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks thanks to you, thanks to Eleanor. Yeah, no, I'm I'm I I don't understand YouTube culture, but I but I I uh, I, I embrace it. Um, okay, yeah, it so good. that ridiculous three quotes thing. Like mm -hmm. Whitman said Whit to have Whit great Bukowski poets. So Whitman says to have great poets, there must be great audiences. Bukowski said to have great audiences, you need great poets. And I said, unless you have great places for these two to meet, it doesn't matter. Yes. And that, all of that seems fine. I, I Something I wonder about, and this is somewhat related to what we were talking about earlier uh, with critics and the the culture at large in a sense of like a like significant gatekeepers i am not somebody who mourns the the passing of major gatekeepers i know it's it's become fashionable among a lot of people lately to say that well actually those gatekeepers are pretty good maybe we need to go back to that i i, I don't i don't feel that but what i do wonder about with this question of great audiences and great poets as and great venues for meeting you know whether that's a literal place or a, an online place or whatever that whatever that medium is the the question i wonder about is is not so much the question of quality right because great means sort of two things right mm -hmm. it means very very good and like that's you're right yeah you definitely need good like very very good poets and you know but but the other part of it is is a, like a substance or breadth Right. In order to be, and this is sort of like, like, um, Eliot talks about being a major poet. And he said, like, part of what is required to be a major poet, like, I don't, I don't care all that much about categorizing major poets, but like, if you are going to do that, I think his argument is a fair one, which is like, in order to be a major poet, you have to have written a lot of stuff. Like you have to have a significant output. And, and I think with great audiences and great poets, the question I start to ask is like, are we going to be capable of having major cultural voices or is it just all going to be micro voices and micro cultures? Cause I think, I don't know. I think like you can have excellent poets in, in a little niche subculture, but I don't know if, I don't know if greatness fits in the same way. Like I, I don't know if it's possible to have greatness if, your audience is atomized and your poets are all siloed off and there is nothing even remotely resembling a common culture. So you're basically saying that all of this boils down to marketing. <laughs> when, uh, I didn't think I was saying that. <laughs> so Buckley says Maybe. that you need great marketing. <laughs> I, I guess. I mean, I think, I think marketing aside, like, well, like part of great marketing right now is not, if you're a smart marketer today, you're probably not trying to reach everybody. You're probably trying to reach a more focused target audience. Who could be, be a great audience. Yeah. Well, I think like great, that's where great, like if great means something other than the superlative of good, right? If great means something other than just double plus good, then it has to have something to do with with heft, with size, with breadth. And I and I wonder how much greatness is possible if all of your audiences and all of your voices are all micro-targeted mini subcultures. I, I think 
that whole thing really depends on do we need to determine the size of a great audience? Like what makes an audience great number wise? Because when I was first thinking of this, I was just thinking of people in a room, you know, like you go into a room to do a poetry reading and there's going to be people there who don't give a shit or there's going to be people there who do give a shit. But like when you're, when I hear you talk about it, the scope is a lot more grand. And so I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Well, well, I'm trying, I'm trying to, to grapple with what great poet means. What do we mean when we're talking about great poet? Do we just mean very, very, very good poet? Uh, I think it means a, really a poet, a poet that lasts. But also, presumably, has broad influence, right? Yeah. Isn't that part of greatness? Well, if you're going to have broad influence, then even if you're, even if it's a small room at first, it needs to be a small room filled with people who are connected broadly, like who will yeah. take that elsewhere. I mean, that was the the. Um, yeah, that, that, I, I don't know that that's happening. I, I don't know that our subcultures cross-pollinate in that kind of way. This sounds like Rob McEwen at Carnegie Hall. I think that's what this is going to boil down to. Yeah, I mean, But then you that, have to say still, that he's great. No, I don't think you have to say he's great. <laughs> I think you can say I think you can say he he had the uh, the um, the reach that you would need to be great. But yeah, what he reached them with wasn't didn't have much to it you know yeah i don't know some of those people think he had a lot man yeah but he also hasn't like what's what impact has he had like what legacy has he had who who reads him today like i think part of greatness Nobody. is that yeah right P- part of greatness is is lasting and is and is spreading i mean Influence. You know, like, yeah yeah and yeah i mean just at like shakespeare added you know countless phrases to our vocabulary that we don't even think about as being his is like his legacy like that that's a great greatness you know like like dante invented a whole way of thinking about the universe that we still invoke today even even people who've never read dante so i I think like that's that's how i think of greatness and i think if you're going to be great in that way you have to have real reach and i just don't know that that happens it's possible yeah that's interesting or maybe maybe where it is possible like, like, you know, it, it is possible to some extent with like some Insta poets. Mm-hmm. I mean, still that's a slice of the culture, but they have a significant, you know, like if, if you're on a late night, I mean, not that anybody fucking watches the mainstream late night shows anymore, apparently either. Like they're all going down the tubes, but, but, uh, but like if Ruby Keller is on Jimmy Fallon, that's a significant reach. But again, it may be that like, in order to get to that point, you, what you're peddling has to be pretty flimsy like yeah because like honestly like her next big step i think is she's either going to get a deal for a netflix show or Mm -hmm. marvel is going to hire her to write a comic book of some sort that's that's the that's the next level of stardom okay so this last fucking insanity question um and 50 years where do you see poetry that's like the cut into the quick i don't and this is related to one of the other questions in there but i i don't i have no idea i tend my rule of thumb is if it's super uncool now it's probably going to get resuscitated in some form it's like maybe people will be writing like marginal glosses or like a little italics note on the sides it's like he you like you next to your stanza you like summarize the stanza you're like in which he perceives the future in a bowl of radish yeah. or some shit like maybe that'll come back maybe we'll have maybe maybe like verse drama will come back maybe we'll have like you know there's so many there's so many dumb fucking cartoony tv shows or pseudo tv shows streaming like maybe maybe we'll have verse drama again it'll be it'll be like spoken word verse drama rather than yeah rather than uh elizabethan but um yeah i don't know i think like whatever name whatever seems most fusty and like somebody will revive it in the way like somebody will do something with it uh I, I don't i also just don't think poetry changes that much which is related to your question who like who is advanced poetry most oh shit i skipped that one all together yeah yeah well, who's I, advanced I horrible, poetry most horrible answer to that. Homer. well let me hear it homer yeah i think poetry that's doesn't sad advance. no it's not i think it's you don't think like, that's sad 
No, I don't think poetry, I don't think it, there's, I don't think poetry has progress. I don't think there's advancement. I think there, there's great poetry written at all these different periods. And there are poets who speak to one another, sometimes even seemingly, you know, into the future. But I don't think as an art form, it advances. I, I, had, I, had, I think I mentioned this on the show at some point, like I had a, my freshman year roommate was a um, uh, was majoring in genetics. And he said, like, why do you read the old stuff? Why don't you just read the new stuff that you know is right? Yeah, and like that right exactly. there is a pretty is a pretty clear uh, demonstration of like how poetry doesn't progress. Well, that's what I was going to ask you when you brought that up on the show. I was going to ask you, like, do you still think the earth is flat? Like, why do you, like, just look at the science act or poetry from that period and go, this is all there is. This is all that there can be. I didn't be. say nothing. Prog- I didn't say there's no <laughs> progress. I said poetry no, doesn't progress. Like, science no, I progresses, know. obviously, yes. But, like, what's the difference there? Like, do you not think, like, poets or practitioners in the art of poetry, just as scientists are practitioners in the art of future I think I science is that. science is not an science is not an art. Like science is a way of knowing that is that is measurable, that is repeatable. But it's ever changing. It's not necessarily repeatable because it's based on theory. And if well, it, like we wouldn't it, have the, new I, sciences if it didn't change, if it didn't Yeah, no, not no, I'm saying science does change, but like it changes because its systems for measurement are repeatable. Meaning if I do a scientific experiment here and it's, and it's an act and it like, and I do it accurately, then you should be able to get the same result in a totally different part of the world in a totally different time. Like that, that's the, like the nature of science is that it's, it's measurable, it's objective, it's repeatable. And so you can add to the sum of knowledge. Now, often what you're adding is like, oops, that didn't work out. Or like, this turns out not to be what we thought. But but isn't that but what formal are... poetry is? No, no, there's just more poems. You're not, you're not altering the fundamental understanding of what poetry is. You're just, there's just other stuff. Like you can disprove scientific theories from Socrates' time. Yeah. You can't disprove the poets from Socrates' time. Oh, someone's going to argue with you on that one. I don't know. Who, I mean, you can like I'll... you can tell me that they're <laughs> that like they shouldn't have believed slavery was okay, and like I agree with you there. But you're not disproving Antigone, right? Okay, like, it's, okay. It's a great play. It just it just is like there are there are flaws with it, but they're the same flaws that were with, there with it at the time. I don't think we know more about poetry than Homer knew. I think we just have more over more time, but we definitely so, know more about science. We know more about physics than Isaac Newton knew, even if he was the smartest man who ever lived. Like, but we've added forms to poetry, right? I mean, precious few. Like, like show me a really enduring form that's been invented, honest to God, in the last hundred years. What's that Google one that you like so much? Flarf. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is a thing you can do with words. Like, I feel like that's the, that's like the, that's, I think what all we're doing is we're like, we're reverse engineering the like papyrus, like Egyptian toilet paper dumps where they have found all of Sappho's poems. Yeah. They're just like, oh, here's some jumbled ups. They're not even that new. They're like an erasure is again, it's like, it's a, it's a, it's a new way of thinking about a palimpsest, right? Which has existed since forever, since as long as we've had writing. So, I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's not possible for there to for there to be anything novel in writing. There are nonce forms. Uh, A.E. Stallings is a poet I was reading today. She's invented a number of kind of interesting little nonce forms that I don't think anybody had exactly done before. But the other thing up here, which is true, like, here's the other thing. Like, if, if, if there is, you know, name a scientist, Gregor Mendel, did these these you know these astounding experiments with uh, uh, bean genetics? We can do exactly those experiments today. Yeah. Right. We can't write what Homer wrote. Like we, it's not like he did a thing that and there was a formula for it, and then we said, "Oh, now I can write my own epic." 
like you can try motherfucker but it's not going to turn out very good like you know like so so it's like yeah we you can invent new nonce forms but it's not like we've advanced beyond any great, great poet of the past okay maybe this maybe advance is the wrong word let's say influence who's influenced poetry the most yeah homer and you're gonna say homer <laughs> same, same, same answer, <laughs> yeah. same answer. Yeah. are we on breaking yeah. form what the fuck's going on right now I'm just joking. No, I mean, I think that's yeah. I'm, like, I'm kidding, dude. I'm kidding. No, yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah. A that's a good point. That's a good point. Do you think? Oh, come on. You think they would say Homer? No, they would. They no, would have something but I'm just saying they would have a safe answer. answer. Yeah, a safe answer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, they would I say Carl Phillips. I just think that's an accurate answer. Like, who? Like, who yeah. am I going to name? That's going to be if you, like if you want an actually influential poet. Like, who am I going to name? That's not going to be safe. I mean, you know, you want. I'll tell you, like a an extremely influential poet who's not safe, but it's still accurate would be Ezra Pound. But like, yeah, he was a fascist, and he also influential. He was maybe he was maybe more influential as a critic and a curator than he was as a poet. But he was pretty fucking influential. Yeah, I was just talking to someone about him yesterday. How um, I said the thing he because I have issues with I have issues. Okay. Real quick, like I, you have issues with like, Ezra Pound. You're like, I have you're, issues with. Ezra you're breaking Pound. new ground here. This is <laughs> Matt Wall has issues with yeah. Ezra Pound. What, no like, shit. How, how could this no. be? <laughs> well, I'll tell you because he would teach how simple your poetry should be, but then he wrote the fucking Cantos. What the fuck was he thinking doing that? Like it's just oh. like like what the fuck are you doing, sir? But the thing I was saying was like I think that most badass thing he fucking did was Hemingway came to him and showed him poetry and Ezra Pound said to him well in this group I'm the poet guy so why don't you just write short stories and Hemingway's like okay and then just write short stories for the, or whatever and then novels or whatever but the yeah. fact that he hold that card and he's like I see what you're doing here I'm that dude. So you do something else. And then Hemingway says, okay, that is like the ballsiest big swing and dick fucking thing I've ever heard a motherfucker do. Yeah. Like that was just hysterical. Oh, yeah. to me. Um, he also, I think he was the one who introduced Hemingway to Gertrude Stein, who was like Hemingway's master yeah. and really like taught him. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I'll, I'll repeat like Ryan's observation, which was that like, maybe it took Ezra Pound to edit the 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 wasteland down from what because you see like the original version of the wasteland is you know which was called i think he do the police in different voices and then it, it it's gets like radically changed um to the version we know and that's ezra pound's scissors at work so mm -hmm. his observation was like yeah maybe it took ezra pound to do to make the cuts but it also it took t.s Eliot to accept them and i think like it took maybe maybe ezra pound was the big swing and dick who told hemingway to go write short stories but like it took a hemingway to to like take that advice yeah, and for run real. With it, right? You know? Yeah. Uh, particularly being the kind of macho uh, guy that he was. So God bless him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but like how you, all this has been going. Like when I was saying, like, yeah, in 50 years, I hope people are like writing poetry on walls with their shit and piss and cum and just like letting it in blood and letting it dry and then fucking vanish. Like when it gets washed away. Like, did you that miss that part horrible. of the video? Well, I know, but I feel like that's the progression to the extreme of what, like, Insta poetry has done to poetry. Oh, that's to me, it feels so far from that. It feels more like we're moving away from words toward just emojis. I mean, it, like, I don't, it doesn't feel visceral, it doesn't feel like biologically risky <laughs> like, it feels it, like you're, you're describing like an irish hunger strike you know like, like it's, but that's what it's i'm like saying like, you, like you have to that's not there has insta poetry has nothing to do with it. insta poetry is, is no that's what i'm saying movie. that's what i'm saying there has to be like a yeah. complete opposite as a like rebellion against the thing that is you know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, like another possibility then would be, and God only knows where we're headed with this kind of shit. I tend to think, I tend to think we're not going to have major abridgments of freedom of speech the way they do in the UK, but it's possible to imagine poetry becoming actually dangerous again. Yeah. 
like in the UK, I mean, granted, if you want to get arrested for writing poetry in the UK, you have to say something pretty heinous, which like it would be awful to say anyway. Like you would have to say, deny the Holocaust or say something nasty about trans people. Like, but like you could get arrested for that in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Like that doesn't make it worth writing a poem about. But like, I wonder, given the kind of conversations that we're currently having about freedom of speech, if if it if you could see something like i mean um uh i'm about to put out this risk episode and there was a like really alarming to me example of these rappers who got suspended prison sentences for performing a rap song um and so i wonder about like that being a a way i don't think it would be i think any future in which people are do performing poems and getting arrested is a dark future but I wonder if that could be a a kind of development we could see where it suddenly is actually a real risk again. Well, honestly, like it was not that long ago. Like, yeah, oh, it has been on and off throughout poetry's history. Yeah, yeah, but uh, like at here, the moment, and like honestly, if the mid if, if the midterms had gone differently, like I would be having a much different conversation with you right now about this. But like the midterms restored like an ounce of faith of the country not being mm. completely insane yeah 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 so like i felt a little bit better about it but um yeah dude like there are people who want to stifle speech stifle art stifle yeah. literature that are in power right now and it is something that is yeah. very fucking possible it's terrifying yeah so i mean that that's a that's a possible future but i think i think probably it's not going to change very much you know, I think it'll exist in different media a little differently. I think some of the yeah. old things will get will get cool again, and some of the cool things will get tired. But that, yeah, like the fashions will continue to, to turn, but otherwise poetry is going to be what it fucking is. Cameron is predicting a decline in poetry's role in rap. He tends to think that like the the golden age of rap as a lyrical medium is behind us or is is on the wane well yeah i mean we're, we'll have to get Cameron to say more about that because because i do think like what's also true is that if we're going to talk about the history and you know d change if not progress or development of poetry over time then then you can't leave out pop music yeah because that's clearly just a big part of it yeah uh, i mean historically it's like you can you can argue about what counts as poetry or not but like historically speaking it's the same bloodline <laughs> All right, bitches, that's it. That's all there is. I don't know if Bucks will ever come back after that, but maybe he will. Maybe he fucking will. I hope so. Bucks is always a good chat. Love, I love chatting the Bucks. Motherfuckers. So anyway, a bunch of things we need to talk about real quick. First off, are you in the Anarchy Crew yet? Question. Why the fuck not? Why the fuck wouldn't you want over a hundred videos of lessons and workshops with yours truly? Why the fuck wouldn't you not want that? Exactly. So you need to go over to YouTube, to my YouTube page, and I think it's at Matt Wall. It's really fucking easy. You just go there, hit the join button. You could pick the thank you crew, you could pick the anarchy crew, or you could pick the fucking chat book of the month club, which is the same thing as the anarchy crew, but you get all my shit. All my shit. Unbelievable. So this is fucking awesome. There's some other things that we, we got to talk about here too, because it is the holiday season. And I will say this, um, tomorrow, well, some of you might be hearing this on Sunday, but um, if you are listening to the podcast feed, you get it early. And if you are an Anarchy Crew member, you get this early as well. But YouTube's doing something. I don't really understand how it works. But during this holiday festive season, you can actually gift an Anarchy Crew membership to another person that will be in the live stream chat when I go live on Sunday. Okay? Okay. Don't really know how it works. I'm hoping it will be very fucking self-explanatory. But if you would like to give the gift of fucking poetic anarchiness, you can fucking do that. And that would be fucking awesome. 
Also, MacArthur Park. New chapbook for December. It's out now. Also, um, if I could get it, Blood Rag, issue six, out fucking now. We have Matthew Buckley Smith, Ethan McGuire, Alan Mahan, or Mahan. Alan, I've never actually heard you say your last name. How do I pronounce it? Help me. Me, Garrett Carroll. Garrett Carroll's back. And B.L. Kohler. Blood Rag, issue six out fucking now and if you order this at the bottom it says make copies of this post everywhere so do that fucking thing if you order this take it upon yourself to be a fucking anarchist make copies put this everywhere the fuck you want isn't it funny how every time i tell you how to be an anarchist there are rules following it so fucking stupid uh, anyway so do that if you want some mentorship Go over to IHateMountWall.com slash mentorship and see the things I can do. And if the things you want are not in there, hit send me an email. Let me know what the fuck those things are and we'll fucking talk. You know what I'm saying? What else we got here? Oh, yeah. The um, free book. Go to IHateMountWall.com. Sign up for my mailing list. Get the free ebook Because after December, it is Gonzo from the Muppets. Okay. And then there will be something else there. So if you want this book of poems and short stories by this dude with two thumbs, okay, you got to fucking jump on that. Um, Poetic Anarchy on Amazon, the anthologies, plus all my novels, my serials, my poetry, all that shit. You can find that there. Um, also, Blood Rag chat books over on Etsy. My music is everywhere where music is streaming. My art is on my um, Instagram. If you like any of that, hit me up and I'll tell you what's what. And if you have any fucking questions, any fucking comments, if you want to fucking tell me what for, and then tell me what five, and even what six, I'll let you do that. All you have to do is send an email to I hate Matt Wall at gmail.com and, and you're good to go. You can fucking just spill your fucking guts to me. I'll spill mine right back and we'll have a big gut stew. It'll be fucking disgusting. You see what I'm saying? Anyway, folks, you guys are the shit. I fucking heart you like I heart things that I love with my heart. So you know the fucking drill, you know the fucking shovel, and you know the fucking jackhammer. And you know the pile driver because you're a wrestling fan, right? So get out there, fucking type hard, ass and chair, hands on keyboard, guys. All right? And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.